Today we're going to tackle um, a little exercise of making the pillars for the HMS Thorn on the on the shellline lathe. The first thing I did is move the, the lathe to my uh, temporary table that I could work on. So I took out my duplicator. Um, it's from Vega Enterprises Inc. And of course I couldn't find the manual. I probably bought this 15 years ago. Um, so I wrote them a, an email and asked them if they could send me the operations manual. And I got a one-liner, we no longer sell that product. Um, I wrote them back a very rude reply that that was an unacceptable response and haven't heard from them since. I find it um, amazing that um, I, have to, I can only call it the arrogance of some people um, not to support products that they've made in the past. Um, this obsession with obsolescence is really unacceptable and I certainly will never be going there um, to acquire anything from them. They've crossed off my list forever. A company that's quite different than this um, is Sherline, who over the years I have found them spectacular in terms of, of customer service and more importantly when there's an issue um, of leading me to the solution to that issue. Um, most of you know the Sherline lathe. Some of you might use an older Unimat lathe. I purchased this long bed um, Sherline lathe thinking that I needed it for uh, making moss, only to find out that um, you don't make moss on another uh, lathe. And if you do, the short bed is perfectly acceptable to do whatever work is required. Having said that, um, she's a beautiful, beautifully machined product and I cannot endorse it enough. The accessories available um, to solve almost any problem um, you can find on their catalog. There are lots of videos on the net so I'm not going to go through um, and explain you how to use a lathe if you do or if you don't know how to use a lathe, feel free to, to search on YouTube for anything Mark Sherline and you'll find all the details that you want. The first thing we need to do is to make up a, a piece of square stock. And this is some 8x8 eight eight stock, it's oversized. When we've completed the turning part of it, we'll reduce the end stock um, it's six and a half inches at the base and at the top of the pillar or the head of the pillar it's five and a half inches. The first thing we need to do is get the center point on the piece. Um, you can simply do this by drawing a line from the four corners and that will give you a fair indication and then use any pointy instrument to mark the center. And you put it in the lathe. Tighten it down and put the tail stock on and tighten it up. And if you centered the piece well and there's no warping of the, um, of the stock, you should have very little movement at the end. You shouldn't see movement like that. Now we're going to mark out the length of the pieces that we're going to cut. And I take the measurement off the, the piece I'm using and And what we'll do is take our first cut down. Um, there are lots of, of different uh, tools you can use. This is my preferred tool. A quick word about wood. You don't want to be machining 
small pots with any type of soft wood or any type of grainy wood. I'm very lucky that I've discovered juniper, which is a locally available hardwood. But I also have an extremely hardwood called Wamara, which I fortunately have a nice stock of. And I have also machined very successfully purple heart. Uh, green heart, which is a tropical hardwood, is very grainy and not a good not a good wood to use. And you would never use something like mahogany or cedar. The parts will simply break as soon as you start putting a little pressure on it. Because we deal with small stuff, we tend to not think that there is a, a safety issue. I highly recommend, in fact, um, you should not operate a lathe unless you have some sort of eye protection, preferably face protection. Um, I like this big shield, but sometimes I do use smaller, smaller glasses. One of the techniques I found, if you want to know if you've got all the square section down, is to simply rest the tool on the piece that you're cutting. And if you feel the movement, you know that um, you still have more to take down. That's the exaggeration. None there. Then what I'll do is I'll come and flatten it, because. This doesn't necessarily give me an absolute flat suit. Again, just reminding you, the key is to take off the least amount at each pass um, and you won't damage the piece. Now we're going to put the marks on the piece. The marks I put are the, the parts that I need to cut down. So I know I have one right here, I have a big one here, I have another one here, and one here. Now this is where if we could have made up a, a tool, and this is what I try to do with these um, blades. I use the Dremel to shape the blade to give me different different cuts. Unfortunately, it it's not strong enough to work. So now we're going to put the marks using this very pointy piece. And now we can start doing the work. And this is the gouge that I use. We want to take the center part of the column down to four and a half inches. So we have a little bit more to go. And now we clean up with some very fine sandpaper.
I'm very happy with that. So this is the top and that's the bottom. So this will be six and a half inches and the top will be five and a half inches and then we have made a perfect column. So I think that's really all I'm going to go through with you today. Um, keep it small, keep it simple. Um, Lee Valley has some wonderful um, gouges for miniature tools and um, I highly recommend if you have the pocket for it that um, this would be a, an excellent good investment but these are some inexpensive tools that the truth is they work just as fine for those of you who live in tropical climates again I put termite fluid on all of my parts and then I'll seal them in this case with rub on poly but you can seal them with anything that you wish so I hope you found this useful and I'll see you when I develop some other technique in the future bye